I uh, just wanted to let all of you know that we will be doing that. And uh, so eventually, you know, check back in a few days time and hopefully that, that this will be up and the website will be functioning properly. Um, so uh, get started and I'm going to share my screen and um, talk just for a few moments about um, the AIA. Um, our, our event today is um, out of the um, uh, Dr. Baker comes to us as a sponsored lecturer from the Archaeological Institute of America. And as many of you know, um, the AIA is the um, premier national um, organization for archaeology um, of the Mediterranean, um, Middle East, gl global archaeology. And um, we partner with them as a local society and we bring two lecturers <clears throat> from, from their uh, sponsorship each year. Um, we have a um, announcement here indicating that we're recording today um, and a few, um, few important elements of how the AIA is such, such an amazing organization with which to be affiliated. Uh, as many of you know, you can, you can join the AIA uh, um, and then indicate that you'd like to be affiliated with the local society. And that's one way that you can, um, you can sponsor our local society and, and allow for us to continue to have such fantastic lecturers. Uh, and so um, education and advocacy and archaeology are the two uh, main missions of the organization and they support um, practicing archaeologists, also um, teachers, educators. Uh, they provide an amazing um, financial resource and e even um, communications resource to excavations that currently are going on and also fund publications, research and site preservation. Um, in, in, um, Included with, with the membership are um, um, two, two to three different um, publications. If you're interested, you can add on more than one. Um, Archaeology Magazine is the most popular. Some really great, uh, well-written, um, well-documented and beautifully illustrated uh, topics. Um, and then the American Journal of Archaeology is the world's leading journal, um, scholarly journal of Mediterranean archaeology, which uh, many of you may opt uh, to um, receive. Um, a number of the other opportunities that AIA sponsors um, are fieldwork opportunities, and I always like to um, highlight how wonderful it is to be able to go on excavations. Um, one can browse all the list of opportunities there and sign up, um, even as an amateur or as a, um, someone interested in archaeology, you can um, go and visit and work on an excavation for a few weeks. Uh, when I was um, um, 16 years old, I went on my first excavation and it was through the AIA that I was able to find that, that excavation opportunity. I went down to Belize um, and I got the bug and that's been it for me. So, um, you know, 30 plus years later, here I am. Um, there are also some amazing um, travel opportunities, AIA tours um, that hopefully will be resuming in the coming year that, that are a benefit there too. Uh, so lo lots of lots of opportunities to um, engage with archaeology, and I'll say now too, even in in our uh, virtual learning environments, um, AIA is doing a, a very an amazing job of offering a number of virtual opportunities to engage uh, with um, book clubs, um, other exploratory um, websites. So there's a lot that that they're offering. Um, so yeah, so so today. Um, the um, Dr. Baker comes to us um, as the Danielle Z English lecturer, and uh, Dan uh, Danielle English Goldstein um, established this lecture series for an, specifically for a New York society, um, either the Stat local Staten Island or Manhattan or New York City society, and uh, this lecture could be on any topic. Um, although the donor was particularly interested in underwater archaeology. So I think in the past we may have had Dr. Buxton from URI as our, um, as our English lecturer. Uh, president of Harmony and Harmony, a music publishing company, uh, Daniel English um, created the concept and lyrics for Gordy the Goldfish, an educational music CD on the care of goldfish. Um, Ms. English Goldstein served as a general trustee of the Archaeological Institute of America and on the AIA Development and Endowment Campaign Committees. She is active in many other causes in New York City and served as president of the Manhattan Aquarium and Ichthyology Society. And uh, this lecturer is annually chosen by the lecture program committee of the AIA. Uh, and so um, we've, we've had the opportunity to have other 
English lecturers with us in the past few years. Some of you may recall hearing from Michelle Damien and Scott Fitzpatrick um, more, most, most on the past three years, they've been on our, on our program series. So, um, so now what I'll do is I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Celeste Gagnon, um, who is a former VP of um, the Archaeology Society and um, trustee. Um, and um, she will introduce our lecture for us today um, as a fellow um, anthropologist uh, and partner partner in, in, uh, in excavation and, and um, intellectual pursuits. So Celeste, take it away. Hey, everybody. It's so great to see you all. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, and it really is my distinct honor to introduce uh, Dr. Brenda Baker today. As Sarah had mentioned, she comes to us from the Center for Bioarchaeological Research at Arizona State University. And um, she earned her PhD and MA at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and her BS from Northwestern University. Her impressive career focusing on bioarchaeological and mortuary archeological research has taken her to sites in North America, Egypt, Cyprus, and the Sudan where she currently serves as the director of the Bioarchaeology of Nubia Expedition, BONE is its acronym. And it's her work in the Sudan that she'll be sharing with us today. So she has edited or co-authored three volumes, published more than 30 peer reviewed articles, as well as an extensive list of reports and other kinds of documentation on topics ranging from understanding ancient disease to tracing human migrations, to investigating the lives of ancient children and reconstructing the massacre at Fort William Henry in New York. Her work has been funded by the Winter Grant Foundation, NSF, USADI, USAID, um, the Lucille and Packard Foundation, among many others. And so obviously really impressive researcher, but I would be remiss if I didn't tell you what an amazing colleague and mentor Brenda has been to me and to many others. She actually offered me my very first paying gig as a bioarchaeologist while she was the curator of human osteology and the director of repatriation program at the New York State Museum. And it was the position that she left to join the faculty at Arizona State. And through her teaching activities and her variety of actions in professional societies, she's helped to mentor an entire generation of bioarchaeologists. And so I hope that you will please join me in offering a warm welcome to Dr. Baker. Well, thank you very much for that really nice introduction, Celeste. I'm delighted to be speaking for your group uh, and the multitudes of people from all over who are joining us today. Thank you for taking uh, part of your Sunday afternoon out here. Now, let me see here, I need to share my screen. So we will get that set up. And I, I, I will just um, mention to all, please um, hold your questions until Dr. Baker is finished speaking. And um, at that time, <clears throat> we'll ask that you use um, the raise hand feature um, in Zoom if you might have a question for her. And, and then um, we'll, I'll call out your name and you can go ahead and ask your question yourself. Or you can type your questions into the chat box and I'm happy to ask those questions uh, for you. Uh, so, um, but because we have such a large group today, we can't see you all at the same time on a screen. So if you're waving or, you know, jumping up and down, we won't know, know that necessarily. So please do use the raise hand feature or type into the chat um, when we're ready and we, when we can um, field all of your questions. Thanks. All right here. Mm, seemingly having a technical difficulty, so. Hang on just a second here, let me get this, there we go. All right, so hopefully you're all seeing my title slide fully. Okay, great. Uh, let me just get this thing up at the top. <laughs> okay, well, um, I really appreciate you again taking time out uh, to join us today. And I want to tell you a little bit about my work in Sudan and the results of some of the analyses over the years. Uh, so this is going to cover lots of different bases and hopefully there's something for everyone in here. And despite the fact that it's called the Bone Project or Bioarchaeology of Nubia Expedition, it's not just about bones. 
Uh, but there will be images of graves and human remains later in the talk. So I do want to forewarn you if that's going to disturb you in any way. Uh, <clears throat> the project area is located at the top of the Great Bend of the Nile. You see that in the, the red box there with the inset to show that project area. So it's upstream of the fourth cataract where a new dam uh, was constructed and it's filled up this fairly large reservoir behind it. So there was an international rescue campaign in the 2000s uh, because a lot of sites were never recorded, submerged. And in fact, early archeologists had written this entire area upstream of the fourth cataract off thinking that it was too rugged and inhospitable for people to do more than just pass through. So when survey started, lots of sites were being recorded and it was realized that there needed to be a lot of intensive work done in the projected reservoir area and in other areas a little bit farther upstream where irrigation projects would also uh, potentially endanger sites. So I got involved at that point. My first visit to Sudan was in 2006 to set up a project in this area with Stuart Smith of the University of California, Santa Barbara initially, and worked for three seasons on this Maraway Dam archeological salvage project. I decided to continue working in this area because there was a lot of development that was going on. And in fact, Abu Hamed about 35 kilometers to the east here uh, is experiencing a gold mining boom. Uh, so there's a lot of activity, a lot of development in this area. And in fact, you can see the agricultural expansion that has, has begun uh, since 20, uh, sorry, since 1986 up to 2013 extensive agricultural expansion that swallowed up some of the sites that were recorded back in 2003 in the initial survey of the area. And that continues to happen as people move their housing farther into the desert, more irrigation and agricultural fields are then expanding to the area where the housing formerly was and swallowing up a lot of the sites that we already recorded. So we're in a bit of a race. Uh, the bioarchaeology of Nubia expedition project area actually extends for about 33 kilometers along the river, uh, covering from the east end here of Mograd Island on the north bank opposite that big island uh, to this sort of V notch. Uh, so it's even recognizable when you're looking at maps of Sudan. You can, I can spot where my project area is pretty easily. You can see here that the area is traversed by several large wadis or washes like we have here in the Southwest and there are little tributaries called cores. We have recorded 228 sites so far in the project area, uh, ranging from the early stone age into the Islamic period. And you see that most of the sites uh, recorded are in the Eastern half of the project area uh, partly because we are working a bit more intensively there due to the rate of development, uh, there's not as much development in the western end of the project area, uh, and we haven't done quite as much uh, survey and work in that area. So uh, looking at the project area here at the top from the opposite side of the river and stitching together a panorama, you can see that there's this big landmark, Jebel Jalud, uh, in the distance. And that's actually right, uh, right here uh, on this map of the project area. So we've got lots of sites that are situated close to Jebel Jalud uh, and certainly within eyeshot of it. So it's a really, really great landmark in this area. There is research being conducted on the Stone Age use of the area with Deb Olszewski of the University of Pennsylvania. 67 of the sites that we've recorded, uh, which is 29% uh, to date, are from the Stone Age. There's substantial Middle Stone Age activity, particularly in the eastern portion of the project area, and perhaps related to Jebel Tulud and some cobble, river cobble resources in that area. And just for those who may not be so aware of 
deep prehistory, the Middle Stone Age spans roughly from 285,000 to between 50,000 and 28,000 years ago in Africa. Uh, so you see we've got lots of these resources. And in fact, some of the later cemeteries are actually built on lithic scatters of Middle Stone Age material. So we have a lot of multi-component sites. We also have an important Mesolithic site. Uh, it's a production area from, uh, that's on an alluvial terrace about 800 meters from the riverbank. And the radiocarbon dates that we have from shell samples range from about 10,580 to 93, uh, 9530 BP, uh, which is essentially 8630 to 7580 BCE, for those of you who think more in calendar dates. And we have extensive production evidence, including these, these pits in this sedimentary bedrock uplift. Um, so they're a little bit um, ephemeral. We don't really know what they were doing in these pits because a lot of them have been repurposed and are actually used for various purposes by the villagers today. And you see the housing right behind that. So they do things like make a certain type of, of oil and so forth using these pits. Uh, we had Fool cooking a bean dish, cooking in one of them one day. So, so, you know, lots of reuse over time. Now, we also have a lot of ceramics and stone artifacts from the site. Uh, the ceramics are typical of the Mesolithic period. And yes, they did have ceramics that early in this area of Sudan. Uh, so a lot of people think ceramics only came in in the Neolithic. We know they were also seemingly grinding red ochre. We have several uh, hand grinding stones that uh, have staining from red ochre on them, like this example here. And we also start to see microliths and smaller kinds of lithic artifacts uh, coming to the fore uh, during this time period. And there are also grinding slicks around this site in the granite bedrock uplift. So they were using uh, lots of resources around the site. Now, the cemeteries in the project area date from the early Kerma period through the Christian period. And the older cemeteries tend to be uh, from the Kerma period, roughly 2500 to 1000 BCE and date into the subsequent Nabatan period. And they're located in the desert terrace, so along the edge of the Wadi systems for the most part. The later cemeteries from the Meroitic period and on through the Christian and Islamic periods are located in the uh, floodplain area, so they're more in, impacted by the cultivation. Now, I focused on some sites in the area of al Asaliya and al Fob, and I'm gonna talk specifically about a group of intervisible cemeteries just to the south and the southwest of Jabal Jalu. Uh, you see that there where the, uh, the arrow has flown in. So looking at some of these uh, cemetery sites and the way the graves are constructed, they've got these rock pillar or rock tumulus superstructures, and some of these are called bone graves, and you see an example of that at the top left. These use bedrock to form part of the superstructure, and then there are more rocks piled on top of that, and they really mimic Jabal Jalud, uh, as you see in the distance. So there's, there's some aspect potentially of marking that landmark and, and mimicking it. The oldest cemetery, I'm going to start from the oldest and then go into the more recent periods. So the oldest of these intervisible cemeteries that are clustered in that area where that arrow was is the site UCSB 0314. So it was recorded by the, uh, the team from UCSB that did the original survey in 2003, the 14th site that they recorded. So that's how we get that site designation. And you'll see that continuing uh, with ASU sites later in time. So here you see our excavation commencing in February of 2014. And you can see the stone toppings. These are rock tumuli uh, and generally only a course or two of stones piled on top of them. 
So they're around about two to three meter in, in diameter. Brenda, you Brenda, I'm sorry, Brenda, could I just ask you to perhaps um, lean in a little closer to your computer? Sure. Your um, The sound is is going in and out just a little bit. Uh, so okay. yeah. All right, I can Thank do you. that. Okay, so thanks for letting me know. I appreciate that. Uh, so here you see uh, a kite uh, and we've got these, you know, extendable rods that we can take lots of photos with to create these uh, three-dimensional uh, reconstructions. So here you see an overview of that nature, and I'm going to show you the uh, 3D photogrammetry that we've done on select graves at each site. We also do 3D photogrammetry of the burial level. Uh, showing the skeleton and anything that's buried with that individual at the base of the grave. At this particular site, uh, we picked out this particular grave to do the 3D photogrammetry of every layer that we remove. And you can see what this uh, ends up looking like. So we are going to peel back uh, from the superstructure as we go down layer by layer and you can see how this was constructed. And you see the substructure and you start seeing a small pit that was dug into it or a re-entry that went right toward the head and hands of this individual. The head was actually displaced uh, and the, the hands uh, were also somewhat disarticulated. And that was probably from a purposeful grave reentry within memory of this individual's burial uh, because they did very little disturbance, as you see, to the rest of the body. They left it as intact as possible. So it seems that there is a targeted reentry to retrieve certain objects, heirlooms perhaps, like a necklace, rings, and so on. Uh, so these are large superstructures, uh, as you can see in relation, or I'm sorry, large substructures in relation to the superstructures. Those superstructures are only a couple meters in diameter and the substructures underneath them are just as large, but then they narrow down to a smaller basin in which the body was placed and then rocks are put on top of the body around the perimeter and they fill that in. And you can see that the rocks then are partly over the feet, for instance, and laying kind of along her back here. Uh, and this is an older woman. She was interred with a single pot that you see here, uh, kind of between her arm and her knee. And if you look closely, Celeste is probably already keyed into this, along with my other bioart friends, you can see that her, uh, her leg doesn't look quite right here. This is her shin bone, her, her tibia, uh, lower leg bone. And that's a callus formation due to healing of a fractured shin. Uh, so she survived that uh, and it's very well healed, though slightly displaced. So that's a typical sort of grave from 0314. And you can see others we have uh, from her grave, as well as from the others, matte impressions, some leather fragments that indicate they were wrapped in leathers, leather or hides essentially, and then placed on mats or wrapped in the mats as well. They used a lot of red ochre in these burials. So you see this staining around this individual's body from the red ochre. It was just really covered with red ochre. And this person had four pots around the perimeter. Some of them you can't see very well because they're still under the rocks and they got kind of smushed. Uh, but one to four pots with each individual from this particular site. All but one individual was on the right side in a flexed position. Their heads are all oriented roughly to the north toward Jebel Jalud. So Jebel Jalud seems to have been the landmark feature for that orientation. Now these ceramic vessels range in style, but these are all typical perma period kinds of vessels. And you see the black top uh, redware, uh, which is quite common for perma period vessels. But we also had one individual with an Egyptian import. This is from Egyptian marl clay, 
clearly not local. So they are tied into far-flung trade networks and not these backwater people as some of the early archeologists would have had us believe that, well, we really shouldn't spend any time in this area because nobody would have been living there and they were just sort of this peripheral area. Well, we also have lots of beads of ants that they were probably producing locally. Um, ostrich eggshell and ostriches may still have ranged in this area. It may have been more of a savanna grassland at this point in the Kerma period. Uh, but we also have something like uh, some other indications like the carnelian beads that you see at the bottom that aren't local and they would have come from farther afield. Now this site, uh, and there you see a good view of Jebel Jalud on a clear day, uh, the radiocarbon dates that we have from leather samples from to the graves dated to the early to middle coma phases. So the span is roughly from 2140 to 1730 BCE. So this is our oldest of the cemetery sites that we found thus far. Now, right across the wadi is another site designated ASU 0901 because we found it in the, two, well, we documented it in the 2009 season as the first site recorded that season. And this particular site has uh, dome graves that are constructed partly with the bedrock so you don't have to build as much. You've got bedrock sides and you lay the body right on the bedrock and then you build it up a bit. So those are the uh, dome graves right there. And then you see, we also have rock tumulus graves. They're dug into the sand down to the level of bedrock. And then you have uh, rocks placed on top, similar to what we saw at the other site. So looking back uh, where those people are, Okay, they're excavating this outlier grave that was sort of between site 0901 and 0930 just to the north, uh, sort of beyond the shrubbery there. So we had to figure out, well, which one is it more likely to belong to or that we're going to include it with? We included it with site 0901, which turns out to have been a super choice because this burial has some really unusual ceramics with it. And these are a different shape and kinds of decoration than we typically see with perma style ceramics. So they're very unusual. They have affinities with the Gash group, which is uh, in the Eastern desert, the Bhutana desert, uh, close to the Gash River Delta. So closer to the Eritrea, Ethiopian border area and the Red Sea. Um, so in that area or in between. Now this particular individual uh, is buried with a bone tool alongside her back that looks like an implement she would have held and used to make these pots. It's burnished on one end, so sort of a polishing tool and sharper on the other end and she could have used it then to incise these vessels. So. I had the idea that she may have been the person who was actually making this unusual pottery. And could she have been an immigrant? That was one of my big questions. Did she grow up someplace else and come into the area and make these vessels similar to what she was making elsewhere? So, so that was a big question that I had. And I'll get to an answer to that a little bit later with some of the analyses that we've been conducting. Now, there are sherds like these with other graves as well. So she must have been making multiple vessels that other people were interred with too. What's really interesting is when we got down to uh, excavating the chest area as well as her pelvis, as you'll see, there were some very unusual features. There were lesions on the internal surfaces of her ribs. And I want to call attention here to the fact that she's got nicely curved ribs on her left side. Those are normal, remember that. The internal surfaces though, you'll see have some lesions on them. And this nodule is a calcification along with some other little bony plaques that are due to some sort of pathology that occurred, uh, a respiratory infection. 
Now, she has this, we micro CT scanned this nodule and it shows very regular growth and no voids within it. So that means it's got a non-infectious origin. And that is likely related to a hazard of being a potter, which is silicosis. If you're inhaling sand grains and uh, other kinds of, of um, foreign material from dust, uh, you are at an occupational risk for getting silicosis. So miners are prone to it. Uh, people who are using jackhammers to break up concrete today are prone to silicosis and so forth. And it's a, an occupational risk for, uh, for potters as well. So we have really good evidence here of this chronic respiratory infection of a non-infectious origin for this woman. So it's not tuberculosis or some sort of chronic respiratory infection due to a pathogen. It's due to these foreign particles that got into her lungs. And that's not it. In her pelvis, malformed teeth, tissue, and some other ossifications. And these are from a growth known as a teratoma, usually benign tumors. And there you see what we recovered from this woman's pelvis. She was an adult female who died sometime in her 40s. And these are malformed teeth. They're clearly not fetal because these look like permanent molar teeth and they have fully developed roots. This is not what you would see in a fetus. Uh, and then there's a sort of mass that may have been decayed tissue and then some other little bony nodules. So all of these kinds of tissues can develop in a teratoma because it develops from multiple tissue types, mesenchymal tissue types. And I wanna call attention to her lower right ribs, which have been completely deformed and straightened out because this teratoma had grown so large, it was causing this reshaping of her lower rib cage. And this is uh, usually teratomas are no more than a couple of centimeters in diameter. They're called giant teratomas when they get to be bigger than 10 centimeters. And to cause this kind of deformation of her lower ribs, this would have had to have been a very, very large teratoma. At that point, they are prone to rupturing. So this may well have been what caused her death. So quite an interesting woman. The radiocarbon dates for this uh, particular site span uh, the classic Kerma into the late Kerma phase from 1751 to 1370 BCE uh, is the range for the radiocarbon dates that we have, three different dates, three different individuals. And I'm gonna move then to the uh, site just north that I mentioned before, 0930. So just to the north of this, we've got um, two clusters, a southern cluster and a northern cluster that's across a main track that we have. These are not paved roads, but sand tracks. And you can see on this ridge line, we have uh, large uh, dome graves on either side of this depression where the track is today. So those are two ruined uh, dome graves that are on the edge of that ridge line. The grave superstructures at this site are much larger than at the other two sites I just discussed. Rather than being about two meters in diameter, these are more like five meters in diameter. So much, much larger superstructures. The North Cluster shows quite a bit of variation in how these superstructures were built up. And they, did a, they made a real effort to maintain the same elevation of the tops of these graves across that site. So they built them up with alternations of rock and sand layers to level them as they went along. So it's sort of like what you would do to lay a, a tile floor or a concrete floor, you put a layer of sand or chinking stones and things like that to get it all even and keep that level. So really uh, some amazing construction on these, uh, these tomb superstructures. 
The south cluster, as you see, also rather large, but uh, these are much more tightly clustered than the north cluster of graves. Uh, and I was standing atop the northernmost grave, which was somewhat larger than the others that we were working on here. The substructures at this site at 0930 are also rock lined. Uh, there are shallow shafts uh, and most of them were disturbed, but not all of them. Uh, these folks didn't really have much of anything buried with them. So that may be why some of them were still intact. Now, uh, the substructures, I think you can tell are really smaller. Uh, we do have a little bit of, of, you know, remnant here of the rock ring superstructure. And you can see that they've just built the substructure kind of into the middle of that. Okay, Sarah, I see you have frozen on my screen. And are you guys hearing me okay or did I freeze? I'm good? Okay, great. All right, these folks are also all flexed like we saw at the other site and nearly all of them are laid on their right side. There usually seems to be like one person who is on their left side at each of these clusters. The orientation here is different. Most of them have their heads roughly toward the east, toward the rising sun, rather than oriented toward Jebel Dulud, as we saw with that older site. There are leather fragments in lots of these graves, suggesting again that the bodies were wrapped in hides. The grave inclusions, as I mentioned, are minimal. Uh, one individual had a couple of bone beads uh, and that's very unusual. We have not seen bone beads in any other grave. There are also three different species of red seashell mollusks that have been pierced and made into beads that are evident at uh, 0930. We also have faience and ostrich eggshell beads, which seem to be the more common types that we find. So we have ties to the Red Sea, but we also have an Egyptian import. Most of the sherds are early to middle kerma in, in the superstructures. They're sort of in the fill of the superstructures. But this Egyptian New Kingdom pilgrim flask was all broken up, as you can see. Uh, and uh, it was in the shaft fill of one of the largest graves in that south cluster. And it coincides with a late kerma C14 date that we have uh, from 1391 to 1191 calibrated BCE. So this suggests a later time frame for 0930. It's later than those other two clusters of graves from 0314 and 0901 just to the south. Now I'm going to move farther south. And again, if you stand at one of these sites, you can look around because you're on these high prominent points, you can look around and you can see all of these different clusters of graves. So that's why they're called intervisible. You're at one and you can see all of the others. If, educate those who don't know and remind those not to forget. If you walk away from them, then you can't see more than just the one that you walked away from. Passed together when it so was stolen. We have a different burial program here at O3. Uh, sorry, ASU 1404. Uh, this site was documented in the 2014 season. And when we started working there in 2016 and clearing a lot of the sand that accumulated off of some of these graves, we realized that we have larger graves with little satellite graves around them. And that wasn't evident when we initially recorded this site. So this is in keeping with classic Kerma uh, clusters of graves. They're reported at other sites, like right across the river from us uh, in the Polish concession that was worked uh, in the 2000s. Uh, and here we have body positions that, that vary and orientation that varies quite a bit. And so the question is, what's going on here? We've got ceramics ranging from middle Kerma all the way to the Napatan period, and a lot of New Kingdom Egyptian imports and also elements from the Eastern Desert with dash group affinities like we had uh, at that other site. 
And the C14 date of this particular burial that you see here was from tooth enamel because the bones are not very well preserved. The collagen isn't well preserved. That dates it to the late Kerma period. Okay, so that's that particular grave right there. We did excavate the little satellite grave and it turned out to be a child uh, around two to three years of age. So you can see they're buried in that sort of fashion that we saw at the other sites, flexed on their sides, but very different orientation as to which way the head is going. Uh, we have more variability with a superstructure that looks like it would be a Kerma period grave. But when we finally found this substructure, it was this sort of oblong, small slit that had an extended burial on its back, which is sort of an Egyptian idea, but also occurs with later Meroitic burials. So is this a New Kingdom Egyptian influence or is this a Nopitan later burial? Well, we got a couple of dates on this one and it is clearly from the subsequent Nopitan period. Uh, so the dates actually place us from around 768 to around 380 BC for the span of two dates that I got on that. So firmly in the Nopitan period, but we see that there's a change in the burial program and typical fashion of placing the bodies. So this is really interesting and it's our first evidence of Nopitan uh, use of this area. Now, just to kind of bring you back here, comparing all of these sites, all of these bodies generally seem to be wrapped in hides. Many have evidence of mats that may have uh, been placed at the bottom of the grave and they were laid on those or wrapped on uh, mats as well. There are dome graves on the ridge lines at all but 0314. Uh, 0930 has superstructures that are larger and more complex, but they have smaller substructures. There are large graves with small satellite graves at 1404 that differ from the others. And we have a variety of orientations in the bodies and whether they're placed on their right or their left side, but they are all flexed. Only those at site 0314 have pots that are down at the body level placed with the body. So that one is different in that regard. And again, that's our earliest site. So what accounts for all of this variability? Well, one of the things I wanted to figure out is whether with these imports, we have people who are coming into the area and moving in there, which may then account for some of the variability that we're seeing in the way people are placed in these graves and the different kinds of grave structures, superstructures. So Leslie Gregorica and I started working together to do analysis of strontium isotopes. And that's used to assess the mobility of people because you can detect first generation migrants when the tooth enamel is actually forming. So you're taking up uh, signatures from different geological regions through things like the drinking water and the plants that people are ingesting. So I'm not gonna get into all of the intricacies of that, but, uh, but we use this to detect whether people have moved into an area and they grew up elsewhere or whether they grew up in this area where they were buried. Uh, we also wanted to do carbon and nitrogen isotope for dietary reconstruction, but unfortunately, uh, there's not enough collagen to actually do that. So, hot off the press, uh, what we found and what we'll be talking about in an AAPA session on Monday is the change that we see in mobility. And the human uh, strontium ratios are estimated with the local strontium ranges that are generated by the local fauna and the diagenetic human enamel. And you see these dotted lines and that shows the local range. So all of these people who are outside of those dotted lines grew up somewhere else. They're non-local. And you can see over time that the earliest, the early and middle Kerma folks, there are a lot more who grew up elsewhere and immigrated into the region. And that starts decreasing 
uh, as you move into the class of karma. So we're really excited about this to see that we may have a more pastoral economy or segment of the economy early on. And then perhaps we get more uh, settled agriculture developing later in the karma period. Another question then, it harks back to those unusual ceramics with the potter who had the teratoma. Did she grow up someplace else? Well, it turns out she has a local strontium signature. So chances are, given that she's you know, from one of the earlier periods, maybe she learned the potting technique, learned how to make pots from somebody who was an immigrant. And there clearly were a lot of people who were moving into this area from elsewhere. So she must have learned that from someone who moved in. So we're addressing whether these non-local grave inclusions are associated only with people who immigrated into the area or with both local and non-local individuals. And you can see, yeah, we've got imports and odd facets, you know, with these people who are local to the area, like this new kingdom. Kingdom Pilgrim Flask as well. The other thing I want to mention about uh, this particular individual, the potter, uh, our ceramicist, Alexandra Cizak, uh, has done petrographic analysis of the sherds, and the fabric is also local. So she again was making different shapes and decorating these vessels differently than you would expect with her the typical Kerma vessels that you would see in most of the graves. Uh, but she's using local fabric and she did grow up in the region. So this is all really interesting to try to figure out, you know, how these people were interacting and who they were interrelated with. Now, I'm going to switch gears here and give you something completely different and talk a little bit about uh, rock art and rock gongs. And I bet a lot of you never really thought about hitting a rock and listening to whether or not it resonates. When they resonate, they are called rock gongs. So we have some suitable surfaces, but they are limited in the area. And you see a couple of these here, along with some of the uh, rock art to the left. Uh, I've worked with Cornelia Kleinitz of Humboldt University in Berlin and Rupert Till, who's an archaeo musicologist at the University of Huddersfield in the UK, and we published the study in 2015, we have a massive rock gong in our area. Uh, it's a huge granite slab that's uplifted somewhat, and you see uh, Connie Kleinitz there, uh, gives you an idea of the scale. And she mapped 115 cup marks that range in depth between 0.2 and 3 centimeters, uh, so some of them are rather deep, some of, them are, some of them are quite shallow, and they have different degrees of patination. Some of them are fully patinated, so very ancient, and some of them have their light patination, so probably more recently formed, or perhaps uh, played more recently, used more recently, so the patination is worn off a bit. There isn't any rock art in the immediate area, but we've got lots of graves and clusters of graves surrounding this area. So could they hear the rock gong if it were played from the area of these graves? That was a question. Well, we investigated how it was played by looking at the position of the cup marks, and that points to the likely positions that people would have had as they were playing different areas and different sets of these, these indentations or cup marks. And you can see these indentations here uh, on the edges and, uh, and our, our players here in the various comfortable positions that you would take to play some of these indentations. Now, Rupert, had all of the sound equipment that we had to import into Sudan uh, and try to record the sounds that are made when you strike each of these indentations. So they recorded different source uh, players and different hearing positions and different, uh, different musical instruments, basically. Are you hitting it with a rock or something like a drumstick? Uh, wooden versus stone. 
uh, and do they produce different sounds, different levels of reverberation? And you can see Rupert was really getting into his work here, laying down on the job and everything. <laughs> uh, but he wanted to see, you know, does it resonate in the same way, even if he's got his body laid across it? So they did tons of recordings. And again, each cup, each indentation was recorded separately. And if you strike it, this is what it sounds like. Okay, so it sounds just like somebody is tapping a rock. It's not terribly impressive, is it? All right, let me take you to a real rock concert. When you have multiple people playing it, things start to build. When you have multiple players like that, you can easily hear the volume up to or at least 90 meters, probably more than that, among the different clusters of graves. So that was another big question that I had. How far will that sound carry? Now, of course, you have to take into account that there's also wind that you have to factor in. It's a windy area. But they were able to hear it easily for at least 90 meters or more among these different grave clusters. So then you have to start thinking about a soundscape for the funerary rituals taking place. And that gives us a whole new dimension of thinking about this flat area that's sort of in front of the rock gong and the rituals, the ceremonies, um, dancing, singing, feasting that may have taken place along with these funerary rites or commemorations of the dead. Now, um, Ahmed Alamin, our inspector, and Connie did a lot of interviews uh, of the local villagers, uh, some fairly old members, about their interactions and recorded the local knowledge about the rock gong and how it's been used, what kinds of traditions are practiced today. And uh, they asked about the mysterious yellow liquid that was found in some of the, the cups, some of the deeper cups. Was it really what we thought? Well, yes, indeed. It turns out that little boys take target practice and it's a game that they play to see who can fill up the most cups. <laughs> uh, so yes, that. Uh, that's what we thought it was. There's also a game that they play, uh, Rolling Stones. So let me get that going here. Whoops, I don't know, did that play okay? There you go. So you roll the stone, trying to get it into one of the cups. The, the sound that it makes when the gong reverberates when that stone hits it. So people play games with it. They're still engaging with this rock gong today. It's very close to the, the housing at this village. And of course, you know, some of these traditions have taken place for a long time. So some of the kinds of things that people do, um, the rock uh, rolling, the Rolling Stones game, that kind of stuff, or going out there and playing it and singing have long traditions. And uh, this elderly gentleman was talking about some of the singing and playing of the rock gong when he was young. Uh, so people are still engaging with these sites. And we always have to remember that, that they aren't static. Uh, again, you know, think about the reuse of those, those pits at the Mesolithic site as well people are still engaging with these sites today. Now, <laughs> that brings us to El Hosh, the enclosure, which is a post meroitic fort that we did not discover in the project area until 2015, sort of fortuitously, when looking at old Corona satellite imagery from the US government that was taken in 1968. And you see here this square in the red, uh, the red square there, that's a fort. 
that we can't see today because it's completely enveloped by this mature date palm grove. So we didn't know it was there until we saw this, this old satellite imagery and went out to investigate it to see, is it still discernible today? Well, what it looks like today uh, is a mature date palm grove uh, with a lovely irrigation canal. Note that this is a stone built irrigation canal. Uh, here you see a remaining wall of this enclosure. And we interviewed the landowner and he planted the date palms in 1970. So perfect coincidence that the satellite imagery from 1968 showed it prior to the planting of the date palms. He used the riverside, the south wall, to, he dismantled that as you see here on our site plan, he dismantled that and that's what he used to construct his terrific irrigation canal. So water is pumped up now from the river uh, up to this canal and it goes all over these fields and extends for quite some, some, time, uh, some area. Now we did some test excavations in 2015, 2015 yes. Uh, and there's not a lot of area left that's uh, easily testable inside the walls. Um, so we did some work outside the walls uh, where we thought there was a gate at the eastern side. And that turned out to be quite interesting because along the exterior of that east wall, we found a burial at the very base of the wall. And it looks like it's headless, but there is a little bit of the remnant of the back of the head. This is where there was once a date palm tree that probably just the roots chewed up the, the skull for the most part in the irrigation. Uh, so it was not a beheaded person. What we were initially thinking, wow, maybe this was a captive who was decapitated. Uh, that wasn't the case. Uh, so the sensationalistic idea fell by the wayside. <laughs> but uh, we have here uh, a nicely laid out body, uh, supine. You can see that the, the feet were crossed right there at the lower legs. Uh, and we had some charcoal fortuitously from right under the knee that dates it to the post meroitic period. That charcoal was between 432 and 638 CE. Uh, so it's at this point in time when we see uh, from the late meroitic period through the post meroitic period, a whole bunch of forts were constructed along the river between the fourth and fifth, well, even sixth cataract. Uh, and so you see our site right here previously unreported, but these are all stone built forts with this sort of vertical uh, stacking of the stone slabs. Uh, and so quite an extensive network of fortifications that started to be built at this point. And we also found in our own project area, a desert outpost with that similar kind of construction. And this is on a uh, highly elevated area that gives a really expansive view, not just of the Nile, but looking into the desert. So it may have been that they were more concerned about people who were coming in from the desert than they were about people going along the Nile River. So we hope to do some more investigation of that in a future season. So we have here the uh, late Meroitic, post Meroitic settlement area and the array of cemeteries in the floodplain now. And these cemeteries are actually constructed on top of Neolithic to Kerma period habitation sites. So we know that those settlement sites were largely in the floodplain and a lot of them have been destroyed by these later cemeteries digging into them uh, and also through the agricultural productivity of the area as well. Uh, so these are very different kinds of cemeteries. They're huge rock tumuli on the floodplain. So you can see these are massive compared to the Kerma period uh, tumuli that I talked about previously. And the burials in them are in chambers off of grave shafts. So they're rather deep. 
uh, and they're outfitted with necklaces, belts, and lots of pottery, as you see uh, here with this particular individual. There is some evidence for shrouds, but uh, for ours, they were not well preserved at all, although they have been with some sites across the river from us. Uh, so here again, you see this is the eastern portion of UCSB 0301-0302, which I've dubbed for convenience the Kinney Fog School site, because this is the school building right here, and you can see the proximity of all of these graves that range from the post meroitic into the Christian period. And not all of them have these elaborate stone tumulus structures. Some of them are actually not very well marked, uh, like this one here. And the poor person who I, I made excavate there thought I was nuts when I said, there's a grave here. She said, no, this is just a scatter of stones, you're crazy. And she was really kind of disgusted that I made her start excavating there uh, along with a team of our local workmen. And they started going down and sure enough, it expanded into a large rectangular subterranean shaft with a chamber off of it and a beautifully preserved burial placed inside it. And this dates to the end of the Meroitic period, uh, probably the very early centuries AD. Uh, and you see she even had a uh, multi-strand ostrich eggshell bracelet uh, still in place on her right forearm. So even something that looks mundane can turn out to be a very large grave. We were really, really lucky at this site because we had an intact tumulus. Most of them had been re-entered in antiquity or looted more recently. And this one was still intact, and you can see all of the stone, the blocking stones still in place. And removing all of those and coming down to the layer of the burial, you see this is a young adult female uh, laid out here with bowls at her foot and at her head. Uh, she had a circlet around her head and a necklace, so lots of beads. Um, but if you look carefully, you can see there's sort of, you know, why is there kind of a mound there? Well, she had a baby laid atop her wrist and extended along her arm, her left arm here. Uh, so between her arm and her hip. And I could not figure out where that baby's head was. I excavated out her hand, thinking it had fallen into her cupped hand. No, but you can see a bronze ring here. She had rings on both hands but no head. And I was very confused because this is part of the basilar occipital, the lateral masses of the occipital, and they had fallen sort of under her pelvis, but where was the rest of this baby's head? Well, it was not until the right hand was removed that we discovered what had actually happened. The baby was in a breech position and came out either feet or rump first. The modern incidence for breech birth is three to 4% at full term, but it occurs more frequently before the 34th, the 34th week. And this was a premature baby. It was seven to eight fetal months. Uh, so it had not rotated to a head down position. And the mortality is four times higher than in head first delivery largely because the jaw will get caught up like this and, and it cannot be extracted. So both mother and baby were lost during the delivery. So this was something that both horrified us and excited us because it's such an incredibly rare thing to see. On the other hand, it really rips you up to know what happened. The woman was about 27 to 34 years of age at death, probably had other children uh, who were then left motherless. And you look up at the village right by it and you realize how easily something like that could happen today when the nearest clinic is 35 kilometers away. Now, that woman I mentioned, she had beads with her. Many of these graves have imported goods like a silver nose ring that you see up here Silver is found in Western Sudan, so that would have been imported. Uh, the carnelian I've mentioned before, but this one is faceted 
and drilled in a way that Joanna Thanobluska, who analyzed all of the beads from this site, says is Indo-Pacific in origin. Likewise, there are glass tube beads with applied white stripes that are Indo-Pacific. Uh, some she even identified likely from Sri Lanka uh, or India. And most of the glass beads, 15% of them are red, blue, or green drawn and segmented tubes that are from Egypt. So they're tied in through time from the Kerma period on into these far-flung exchange networks. These people were not isolated uh, in the hinterlands. Now it's with these graves at the Guinea Fob school site that we start seeing iron arrowheads and archer stones, uh, knocking stones. Uh, and you see some of these here. They're in graves with eight males. Uh, and what does this signify? They're being shown as archers in death, uh, but this coincides with that era of stonewalled forts being constructed in the area. And we have more ind indications of interpersonal violence, conflict occurring at this time. So it's no wonder they started to build these fortifications. When you see the archery equipment, all of those barbed arrows, and in fact, a sternum from one individual who is uh, his, his sternum or breastbone has been completely penetrated by this barbed arrow. This is the internal surface here, and that's the external surface. That arrow went through all the way uh, so that the shaft actually has a circular indentation on the, the surface of the sternum. It's really pretty amazing. There's other evidence of pathology at this site. Uh, from the sample of 100, we do have some evidence of infectious disease, probably tuberculosis, brucellosis, also known as undulating fever. Uh, and dental pathology starts to get more severe during the Christian period. There's also trauma and interpersonal violence continuing from the post Meroitic into the Christian period. So that sort of thing continues and more fortifications are built in the Christian period. So there's definitely decentralization that occurs after the Meroitic empire uh, you know, basically disintegrates uh, and then probably more people coming into conflict uh, as new uh, kingdoms like Makuria consolidate and perhaps try to gain control of this area. There's still a lot that we need to learn. Uh, we're looking into this dietary shift from the post meroitic to the Christian period that coincides with that increase in dental pathology. And also, uh, as noted just very recently by my, uh, my now uh, Dr. Annie Laurie Norris, uh, who just got her PhD this month, uh, in fact, last week, <laughs> uh, she's noting that this, um, decrease in the amount of protein and increase in consumption of plants like wheat and barley rather than sorghum and millet is coinciding with an increase in indicators associated with anemia in a lot of these kids. So we're gonna be looking more into that. Uh, and we see new aspects of identity occurring in these people. And I've worked with Caitlin Bollhoffner looking at dental avulsion or the purpose of purposeful removal of incisor teeth that's found in some males and females continuing from the post meroitic through the Christian period. And in fact, you still see this in a small number of people in the project area today. So many dimensions of looking at the interrelationships among these people. And one of the things that we do try to do is get the information back to the local communities. We've interviewed people about the sites, as you've seen throughout the presentation. Given the proximity to the school, we started uh, raising funds, donations to give to the schools to try to uh, promote learning uh, with textbooks and posters. We created pamphlets in Arabic and English that were handed out to the schools. Uh, there was construction of a new school uh, started right near our dig house in 2008. 
and we were able to raise funds from friends and family to uh, help them build the school and then make improvements to the schools in the area when we finally got uh, onto the electrical grid in our 2016 season. And uh, I was able to raise enough funds to give uh, the local schools money to connect to the grid system. Uh, and they were thrilled to have electricity uh, with light and ceiling fans, which is really important in this area, particularly during sandstorm season. <laughs> so in conclusion, uh, this area was not a backwater in the past. There were clear ties throughout antiquity to Egypt, uh, the Red Sea, and even beyond. And our ongoing analyses with uh, the artifacts and the skeletal remains will hopefully help us clarify the relationships among these sites through time uh, and the relationships among people uh, within and between these different sites and throughout the region. So I thank you all for your attention and I uh, would like to open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Brenda. Uh, an amazing, amazingly rich um, material that you're all, you and the team and your cohorts are, are finding there. Um, <clears throat> nice to hear about the um, extent of contacts and the diversity of, of um, cultural um, identities that might have existed in, in, in this region. Also fascinating to hear about some of the science and archaeology behind the, the work that you're doing. So, so yes, yeah, so um, if you have a, if folks have questions, um, please go ahead and, and raise your, your digital hand um, or feel free to um, type into the, the chat um, a question that you might have. Oh, Mary Grace uh, asks about rock gongs. Um, they are throughout uh, this region of Nubia. Uh, so uh, Northern Sudan, there are lots of rock gongs. Uh, I do believe they have been found in other places in Africa. Um, Rupert has done work in Europe in cave sites. So when you look at Paleolithic cave sites and you think about uh, some of the geological formations in caves, like stalactites and stalagmites, those reverberate too. Uh, you know, I hadn't even thought about some of these kinds of things before uh, before this work. So, uh, so they're probably all over the place, but not necessarily recognized as such. Uh, Sabrina. Hi, Sabrina uh, asks about the spectrum of pathology, uh, other than the examples that I brought up. Uh, we do seem to have an increase in uh, pathology with the later time periods, uh, an array of infectious diseases, uh, more dental pathology, and you know, more evidence of nonspecific indicators of stress. Uh, lots more trauma as well in the later periods. Uh, so, you know, that's more work is being done on, on that count as well. Anybody else? I got one. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Brenta, I'm wondering, because I don't know anything about like the, the, the local environment about the strontium data and how specific they are to particular locations. I ask because in the Andes, right where I work, we have constant problems um, trying to use strontium alone, at least, to, uh, to tell about movement in populations because the, the complexity of the underlying bedrock in the Andes makes it such that we have lots of different kinds of places that have overlapping strontium values. And so we've had to use add in lead, add in oxygen, other kinds of values to try to sort that out. So I just didn't know how complex or simple the, the underlying lithology is in, in this area. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, can, I can actually defer to Leslie Gregorico, who is on this, uh, she's still hanging in there. And Michelle Bouzon, I think was in here earlier, but I, don't, I think Michelle may have, I don't know if Michelle's still here or not. A lot more work is being done in the area 
uh, right now. So we will have more comparative um, aspects, but I don't know, Leslie, do you wanna chime in on that? Uh, sure, I can chime in briefly. Just that it's not incredibly complex. It has a fair degree of complexity, which does, does give us some heterogeneity in the strontium values, which is good on the one hand when you're trying to measure how nomadic these individuals were, especially in those earlier periods. But we do need more baseline data. And actually, Michelle Buzan is collecting some of that data as part of a NSF grant that she received. We're going to continue to collect that kind of data as well to just get more information about uh, connecting people and their movements to that landscape. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, yeah, lots, you know, as I said, lots of work uh, and lots of people who are, you know, trying to do collaborative aspects so we can build up a better, you know, a better landscape, essentially, or isoscape. Um, Sonia Zakshevsky asked uh, if we know where the migrants are coming from, and that we haven't yet figured out. Given some of these trade networks, I suspect that some of these people may be coming in from, uh, from that Gash Delta area or the Bhutana Desert region, and they may have had connections there. Uh, we're pursuing some biodistance analyses right now. Uh, Jamie Ellinger and Kanye Gotti are working with me on that. Uh, and uh, also we'll be starting a pilot study for genetics that didn't work with the Kerma period remains. We've already tried a pilot study on that, but again, the collagen preservation, the bone protein and tooth protein is so poorly preserved for those older periods. It just you know, was impossible to extract the DNA. Um, I think we're going to have far more success with the post meroitic and Christian period remains in that regard, they're much better preserved. So we'll be working on that and hopefully that will help us figure out in, in association with a wider array of strontium data uh, where these people were moving around. Uh, okay, um, Diane Griffiths asked uh, if the climate is as dry or was as dry as it is now no, actually, uh, I mentioned that in the, uh, in the early Kerma period particularly, but the first portion of the Kerma period, uh, it would have been more humid, wetter, and it would have been more a savanna grassland. Uh, so uh, we do have some faunal data from the Kerma remains that, that have been compared. Uh, one of my graduate students, Alexandra Potasik, has done that work. Uh, and so, you know, we know that it was a little bit wetter at that point, so more grassland, uh, but it would have gotten drier and drier as we moved into, uh, into the medieval times, particularly. Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, Sid Kitchell asked about the agriculture. Uh, how, how rapidly is it covering sites that need to be examined? Uh, well, I showed you that expansion up to 2013, and that is continuing even more rapidly, I would say, because of the increased irrigation capabilities and a huge canal that's been built. Uh, so it's just a race against time. And we've seen many of the sites that we recorded in earlier years already having fall, fallen to the plow. Uh, they've been plowed and planted. Uh, and, and others that are getting disturbed or destroyed by new construction that's going farther into the desert. So it's just, it's a real race. And in fact, the guinea fob school site is mostly under agriculture now and they moved the school uh, to a new building right smack on top of another cemetery. <laughs> so, okay, let's see. Um, we have an aside, not a question. Um, let's see, uh, Carrie asked if the, there's ongoing research or additional reading you can recommend. Um, maybe I can, I can stick my email into the chat and you can contact me and I can, I can give you some recommendations on that. Okay, and uh, 
Zainab, thanks for attending. Uh, does the isotopic analysis refer to any migration or regions? Again, you know, we're not quite sure where all they were coming in from, and we hope that that will get more evident with some of the work that's being conducted. Uh, and hopefully, you know, hopefully in 10 years, we'll be able to tell you that, if not sooner. So I have another, actually, a uh, point, not question. I'm putting here, I'm sending to you in the chat, Brenda, I don't know if you've seen the new work about extracting collagen from enamel, from very small amounts of enamel. Someone just sent it to me the other day because we also struggle with collagen preservation on the North Coast. And so we're constantly at sort of a, a loss to do a, a number of different kinds of isotopic analyses. Yeah, that's how I got some of the radiocarbon dates was with the bioappetite from the tooth enamel. Yeah, yeah. So now there's some some new techniques out there to be able to, to extract that stuff. So I'm just sending you <laughs> the link in case you hadn't seen it. Right, right. Okay, thanks. Okay, so lots of great questions. Yeah, yeah, lots of good, lots of great questions. Any, any, any final, final questions before we wrap up? Okay, so um, thank you so much, Dr. Alan, Baker. Did you have a question? Where yeah, do the do the locals mind that there all these graves are being dug up, or do they just feel that they're not ancestral, therefore not important? Uh, well, you know, when you talk to some people, they are wary of the graves. They don't really want to touch the human remains. It's, you know, sort of a superstition. Um, most of them don't really feel the connection because they view themselves, they've been Arabized. Uh, so, you know, a lot of them, even though they are a Nubian group, they view themselves as more Arab. And they don't see that connection, or they say, you know, we're we're Muslim. Uh, so so they're not seeing that direct linkage. Um, but a lot of it is because they are not really learning a whole lot about ancient Nubia until they get to high school. And a lot of the people in this, you know, it's rural villages, and the high school is in Abu Hamed. So you know, a lot of them don't go to high school. Uh, some do, but, you know, a lot of them don't. So it's, it's you know, really trying to promote um, the education about the cultural heritage in the area uh, and value those graves. But, you know, the fact that they moved the school building from right next to one of these big cemeteries and they put it right plop on another cemetery that's huge. It's like, why would you do that? <laughs> So, you know, we were trying to do some salvage excavation there because they damaged a lot of the graves in the process. Uh, and when I go back, uh, you know, I'm gonna try to work with the, the headmaster and the school teachers to see if we can, you know, try to preserve what's left and maybe put some signage up to give them some more information about, you know, what we learned from those graves that we, we only excavated three of them, I think, but, you know, maybe we can do a little more. Great, so I think um, there's one more question, Brenda, um, about whether this area has been affected by wars. Uh, Any more recent no, conflict? I mean, recently, no. In antiquity, obviously we have, you know, the evidence for conflict, but, uh, but you know, not recently. Um, Darfur and uh, the border towards South Sudan is where the conflict has been occurring today. Um, someone else had a raised hand, but I've lost who that was. Well, that Diane, did you? We good. We got your question. Okay. Okay. okay good. Right. Just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anybody here who's hanging in till the bitter end here. <laughs> yeah, I went through a lot. So, you know, I went a little longer than I anticipated, but I just really wanted to give you, you know, an overview. It's, uh, it's a lot to cram in six different field seasons and a lot of uh, subsequent analyses going on. Great, great. Well, thanks again. And, and thanks everybody for, for your attending, attendance. And we will um, be posting this to our website as soon as we get the website back up, hopefully this week. 
Um, and um, please do um, look, look at look at your inboxes for an email regarding adding your names to our um, our e, e listserv so that we can share uh, upcoming events and, and programs with you all. Uh, so thank you to the AIA. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Thank you, Dr. Gagnon, um, and for everybody who's here today. All right. And thank you all for attending. That's a wrap. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.